I was with him at the Grammys backstage. Uh, he invited me to the dressing room because we'd met. And, and uh, once again, you just find yourself wanting to talk about songs. You just, you know, I just kept saying, if I fell, if I fell, Paul, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. How does he treat you? I mean, what does Paul McCartney say to Barry Gibb? Um, uh, not much. I mean, I, I, you know, he's, he's very kind and very gentle and respectful. And, and uh, he, he actually recorded Too Much Heaven. It never went out, but he's but he wants to send me the master so I can look at it and see if we can really enhance it. But he did. Robin got him to do too much heaven in England. But uh, yeah, I think he's become uh, well. He's always been one of my heroes, and and just just knowing the man is is, is inspiring, inspiring. I, I feel that way about Bruce, but I haven't met him yet. Right. You know. Well, I hope I yeah, hope it happens. So, you know, I hope it happens for you and Bruce because there, there's a there's actually far more synergy between you and Bruce than I think a, a lot of people would realize, and and particularly with a lot of the music that you're interested in now, that yeah. that Bruce has has dabbled in those kinds of songs oh, uh, as album country. tracks. Yeah, there's a country street right through Bruce Springsteen. It's it's it can't be ignored, you know. Um, so he did stay in alive in Australia for us, and. I did. Um, I'm on fire. Song to him. Yeah, I'm on fire. Yeah, I returned the favor, and and the crowd was was chanting Bruce, and it was just wonderful. Well, Brandy Carlisle chose "Run to Me," oh. and um, and she does a, a yeah. stunning job on this. I mean, everyone does a stunning job, but she she has got some voice. And and I remember Lulu yeah. saying, and this is only a couple of years ago. Lulu was in concert in New Zealand, and and yeah. she told a story on stage about how she was with you guys and, and obviously married to Morris at the time and, and that she was there when she feels she was there when Run To Me was written because you were singing the verse and Robin wasn't there and then Robin walked in and then just started singing this chorus that somehow matched perfectly with the yeah. verse. Is, it, is that anything like how you remember it? No. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's a good story, but, though. But that, doesn't mean it, that doesn't mean it's not true. So, you know, there are some things that you never leave you, and there are some things that you can never remember. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it's just the way it is. Whatever, whatever Lulu said, it probably happened that way, but I don't remember it happening that way. So I, I don't remember how it actually happened anyway, so I'll go with Lulu. <laughs> <laughs> were there were there times like that though that it was the marriage of one of your ideas with one of robin's ideas and with morris kind of pulling it all well, together it was it was it was basically scat singing you know you sat around and you you and you improvised and so if i sang that verse and got to the point where this is where the chorus has to happen um I can't remember who came up with run to, with the actual chorus, but probably Robin, and and we liked the idea that his voice is higher than mine, and it lifts the song up, and and I think it worked a treat. I, I think it worked a treat, but you know, the memory's vague, the memory's vague. But that's how we always worked, basically just spontaneous scat singing or making things up as you go along, and agreeing between us that. Uh, we could come up with anything. It, it doesn't matter. We can come up with anything as long as we can all we can throw something out if we don't like it. You know. What did Brandy yeah. Carlisle bring to it? Oh uh, well, this is this is one of the greats. This is this this lady is is going to be legendary. I've never heard a, a, a anyone any lady sing quite like that. You know, and 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 that was a that was an honor. Now she didn't do it. I wasn't there when she did her vocals because. We had to dance around dates, and I hadn't come into town at that point. So, so she she recorded it without me there, with Dave. And you know, I did notice a few things about um, Brandy as well as other people. Is like Alison, for instance, they're not very comfortable doing their vocals with other people listening. Right. And 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 so Alison, when I was gone, Alison went back in and did her vocals again. And um, same with Brandy. They did their vocals uh, be before I even arrived. So that was a fantastic surprise because it was sort of like, okay, okay, we this is the glass is broken. We now know what to do, you know. So it was it was great. We didn't know where we were going uh, when we first got to Nashville. What what the comp what the 
premise really was, you know. They weren't firmly projected to be duets. I was going to I was going to just do a little cameo here or there. And if they had sang those songs without me, that would have been fine too, mm. you know. So it just ended up that way. And I think you've got to leave yourself open to that. Just, you know, don't don't plan too much ahead. Allow for the surprises. I think I think that's a good motto. And and indeed, despite you know the the fact that you're a, you're a lead singer as a BG, and and also with solo work, that you're also very experienced as a background singer for all the artists yeah. that you've you've written for, and particularly you know female artists that that how your oh, voice yeah. slots in. I mean, you're you're the Supremes in Chain Reaction. That that background vocal is so oh, distinct. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. But that was a demo, you know, uh, um, before before Diana ever heard it. Uh, all of that was done. The, the, uh, the backtrack and the background vocals and stuff like that. And I think there was some kind of lead there too in falsetto. And that's how, and that was the end of her session. She said, is there anything else we can do? We had nine tracks. And I said, well, we said, well, there's this, this song <laughs> called Chain Reaction that we have on the shelf. And she freaked and said, let's do that, you know. Um, yeah. You mentioned Alison yeah. Krauss. Um, so she does Too Much Heaven on the album. And, and yeah. the story's about Too Much Heaven. Okay, let, let's talk about the Bee Gees one first. Um, you wrote that the same afternoon as Shadow Dancing and Tragedy. And yes. I don't know if in the history of music, anyone before or since has ever written three number one hits in one afternoon. And, and this was like on well, the set of Sgt. Pepper, wasn't it? No, it wasn't. It was it was in the hotel. It was in the house that we'd rented, and it, there was every all over the house. There was a letter H, and we didn't know if it was George Hamilton's house or Johnny Halliday's house. Right. So we just never knew, you know, because these famous people would have houses in L.A. and they'd just rent them out if they weren't there. So we were there, and and we weren't filming, so we had nothing to do, and and we just played and sang all day and and Billy Thorpe came to visit us um, because he was trying to make his mark in America and so that was fantastic because I've been a fan of Billy, Billy Thorpe's all my life you know? yeah so just in that one day yeah it's true <laughs> like it's it quite insane but we didn't know they were number ones we were no. just having fun yeah uh, too much heaven with Alison Krauss. Uh, you've taken a song which is which is really an R and B ballad, and then you've made it work with Alison. So how did that transition happen? Well, I mean, it it was her choice. It, it was her, she, you know, there, it was obviously put to her by Jay Landers, and she said yes. I'll, I'd love to sing a Bee Gees song, but I, I would I would like to sing Too Much Heaven, and that was her choice. And that's really how it came about. It didn't. Nobody was, nobody was asked to sing a certain song. You know, so they came up with their own thoughts. They had a list to go by, and uh, mm. and that was it. it and, and she's won like more Grammys than anyone ever. <laughs> <She's>, I know. <laughs> I know. She's a. Uh, so, you know, I have enormous respect for incredible. her. She's just amazing. Mm. Have you seen Down from the Mountain? No, I haven't. Oh man, you must. It's a. It's, uh, it's the live show at the Ryman of the soundtrack of Oh Brother Where Art Thou. Oh, right. You can't miss it. It's the most entertaining. It's Emmylou Harris and Allison and Gillian and Dave Rawlings. The peop- That's where I fell in love with them, watching that. Mm. And you have to see it. You have to see it. Well, her version that's another, of that's on your wish list too. It, it is her version of "Down to the River." I went down to the river to pray, and and exactly they do that. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I. But they do it live. They right. do it live, and it's wonderful. You know, and and it, th- that sort of um, that sort of spirituality, and I've said this to you before, but but it runs through a deceptively large number of your songs. This kind of this this subtle spirituality, which which I think has a lot of appeal for your music. Uh, well, yeah, I, I think that's true. Uh, I think that's true, and I, I I can't honestly tell you why or how that comes about, but I think that's that was true of all three of us. We weren't necessarily uh, going to church, but we were very we, we had a lot of faith, you know. We had a lot of faith, and maybe that came into the songs. I don't know, but we always had an opinion about something, and that 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 goes into the songs. Mm. Lonely Days um, that you do uh, yeah. with Little Big Town. Uh, so their yeah. harmonies, uh, what was it like working with them? 
Oh, amazing. Uh, amazing. And they were so sweet because they, they really only needed to do one song. The tribute show at the Grammys, remember that? Yeah. Uh, Little Big Town were the only artists that actually found their way to the dressing room and said hello to me. I, I never actually met any of the other artists. Really? Yeah. Um, you know, it, this was Grammy time. Everybody was so busy that this was all like a machine. It was just all like a machine. And, and um, those people, they made that choice. They came to see us, you know. And and I talked to them afterwards, and we took pictures, and, and one of them was wearing a jacket with the Bee Gees on the back, and that was just, that was fantastic. So for me, um, they are the best. And when we when we did those vocals, um, it reminded me of singing with my brothers. It was just it was just an amazing experience. That that's so fascinating. Do you think that that other artists uh, are nervous to come up to you, or what do you think it was? I think it's mutual. I think it's mutual. I, um, I never realised that, but but I come to realise it working with Dave and these other artists, that everybody was a little nervous. and But I thought I was the only one that was nervous, you know? <laughs> but apparently, we all were, you know? Um, uh, everyone, every single artist was was a little uh, unnerved by being, in this, by being at a microphone with me, and I don't know why. I just don't know why. Because you couldn't have been more nervous than me. <laughs> so I just, I didn't, I didn't know. And then Dave told me later. You know, um, it's, it's incredible. Well, the, the respect, you know, the respect that, that you fought long and hard for, but, but that, that respect is there. Anyone who knows anything about music has enormous respect yeah. for you as, as, as being virtually peerless. I mean, you're, you're mentioned in the, in the same breath as Paul McCartney, so um, I, I'm pleased, well, that, I'm pleased that, that, that they have that respect. That's an enormous honour. That's an enormous honour, and it'll never be anything else for me because I'm a fan, you know. I, I'll end up in the audience. I know I will <laughs> one day. <laughs> but, you know, it took 40 years to get to this point, to have one more hit album or one, or one more record that, that would bring us back to the attention of the public somehow, you know. So it's a real dream come true. Mm. A real dream come true. But I, I think that's, that story is a really crucial part in figuring out the Bee Gees and, and figuring you out is there's something in you yeah. that never ever gave up. Like every part of the journey right. from the from the sixties onwards, yeah. um, you know, th- through the first breakup and then and then the slight lull in the yeah. early seventies and then the backlash in the in the early eighties, um, and then the comeback in the late eighties, then the even bigger comeback in the late nineties. There's something in you that refuses to give up. Well, I think it's just uh, my, my own obsession with, with um, singing and playing and writing. So it's, it's just a personal obsession. I never, I never could walk away from it, you know. If an album didn't work, then we make another one, you know. So I never really felt like it was over. You, usually groups or artists have a five-year span. I probably said that before because I always believed that was true, you know. You've got a good five years and if you can get, if you can stick around longer than that, good for you. But, but the industry changes so fast, and and you can at the end of each decade, you can be dismissed quite easily, you know. So you've got to keep, you've got to keep going, mate. I've never felt any other way, but well, let's just try again, mm. you know. Yeah. Do you ever go back and listen to some of the the albums? That didn't sell through the roof, but your your fans love. I mean, one I think of. There are countless ones I think of, but Living Eyes, for example. Um, yeah. You, fans of the Bee Gees well, adore that album. Isn't that strange? Uh, well, you know what happened is that we lost we lost Robert Stigwood. We we lost the support that we would have had if if if, um, if we'd had the team behind us that we'd always had. You know, but then our our copyrights were taken away from us. And we had to fight to get them back, and that was going on the whole time that that album was out there. So uh, it, that was the album that followed Spirits Having Flown, and there was a lot of people against us at that point, business-wise, business-wise. So we had to suffer the slings and arrows of that. But Living Eyes is one of my favorite albums too. I haven't—you're right—I haven't actually gone back and listened to it, but 
but uh, but I love that album. And we were we were also trying to deal with not using the falsetto. So trying to move on, trying to change, as we always did, you know. And and we had to do that. And so we had to eliminate the falsetto, even though it was tempting. And after Spirits, we we had to we had to back that off, you know. Yeah, well, the, the, the album. The, some of the songs yeah. on that. Uh, I mean, have a listen again, Barry. It's <laughs> just yeah, well, like, um, uh, I mean, Di- yeah. Nothing Could Be Good uh, is one of my all-time favorites. And that, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's another yeah. one which has got the, this crazy harmony that comes in late um, where, where you sing, sing to the Almighty if that's what you need to do. So, again, that sort of spiritual thing. Um, R- Robins yeah. Don't Fall In Love With Me, the hook where the three of you are singing Gonna Be A Lonely Night, Nothing But A Lonely Night. I mean, that, that to me is... is Magic. Wow, you're making God. You're, I'm getting such visions from what you're saying because I haven't listened to that album in years. You know, just shows you. Mm. It just shows you. Yeah, no, I, I, it was a, it was it was sad for us because we were in so much conflict with the industry, with with our management, with the record company. I know there was great conflict between Armand Ertigan and Robert Stigwood, and we were on Atlantic, and we were just caught up in the middle of all of it. So I think. All the strife that we had was somehow in, in industry created um, because Robert had lost us as, as his act. And, and I think there was a lot of um, anger, if you like, about that because we were fighting to get our songs back. And, and, and that you didn't go down well with anyone. You, you did get them back, didn't you? I mean, the, yeah. the lawsuits at the time, I've never mentioned this to you because normally you don't mention things like this, but the, the lawsuits well, were, the, were know, the biggest in music history. Anymore. Yeah. It, it was the battle huge. that perhaps Taylor Swift is having to deal with now. You know that someone else can take your songs away, and 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 you that can happen to you without anybody ever telling you. You know. So first off, I found out that that, that had happened. Then I told Robert that that they were, I would never write another song for him if he didn't return the songs. You know. And and that was the kind of crisis that was going on behind all of that so-called backlash. You know, Tim. Mm. It wasn't just um, too much disco. It wasn't it, that could never have been the case, because the results of that were not great. In other words, records didn't really sell very well after that, except for Michael Jackson. So, I think they should have left well enough alone. It was going to evolve anyway. Mm. You know, don't burn records. You know, it, it, that's like burning books. You don't do that. <laughs> well, what would you say to Steve Dahl, who, who Dahl. features prominently? in the, the amazing new documentary about you guys, which is getting rave reviews too, um, which yeah. um, which I helped out a, a little bit on. Um, yeah. What would you say to Steve Dahl, you know, if you if you bumped into him now, the guy behind the, the disco demolition? I, I don't know burning. him. I've never met him and I've never seen him. Uh, I have no desire to. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think that I think that's fair enough. I, I mean, but but one thing, yeah. one thing I always think about the backlash is that is that the album with Barbara Streisand, Guilty, um, was was at the height of that backlash, and it had your face on it, and so people knew that yeah. that you were there, and it sold fifteen million copies. So so the backlash, yeah, the backlash existed, but but you guys, even with your well, face just, on the cover, could yeah. still sell. I just don't believe that it was about us. You know, I think it was about the whole syndrome of of uh, dance music and Studio 54 and all that stuff that we were we were actually never involved in him. So we got sucked into all of that, um, the slings and arrows, if you like, uh, mm. as to why things change all of a sudden, which they do. You know, it still staggers me that the Beatles were only a 10-year situation, you know. And, and look what they did in 10 years. Mm. Uh, but But everything changes and it changes really quick so at the end of each decade somebody's out of style you know and i i don't understand um why the guilty album was as successful as it was dealing with the backlash at the same time and dion warwick and 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 chain reaction with diana i i were and kenny and dolly i i just managed to convince my brothers that we needed to make our mark as songwriters uh, because that's what we have. That's what we do. You know, we we weren't we didn't really want to sing every song, but we wanted to continue. We wanted to get respect for writing songs, mm. and that so that's the journey we went on after that. Well, that that first half of the eighties, 
Um, you yeah. you wrote a dozen albums, um, both for other artists, uh, for yourselves, and um, as solo projects. The, the yeah. how prolific you you were during that period is actually astonishing. You're just writing and writing. It is, it, it is but we were so ambitious, you know. Um, we were, um, yeah. I don't, I, I don't. I think it's animal energy. I, I just, I think that when you're that young, and there's a certain kind of energy in your body, in your brain, that that is very powerful. It's only when you get older that you just everything slows down, you know. And and you're not as hyper as you were when you're 30 or 25. And and that's <laughs> that's, that's okay. Sort of what happened? We could <laughs> couldn't stop. We couldn't stop. The story of Islands in the Stream. Okay, so it's it's, it's often told story that it was originally intended for for Diana Ross. Um, Robin even once suggested maybe Marvin Gaye. Um, but but you're doing it with with Kenny. Kenny's recorded it a, a million times, and he he's like, okay, the, this is not working. And and is it true that Dolly was just coincidentally in the same building back in 1983? No, no, no. totally untrue. <laughs> and 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 and, and I, I I keep wanting to say to to Kenny, you, 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 that's that's not what happened. Your your memories, your memories changed. Our memories change. You know? Yeah. Um. If if that had happened, if if Dolly had been in that studio by accident on that day, we would have had to find a key, her key, mm. for the song. So the the backtrack was already cut. We were doing vocals, and so it had to have been arranged weeks previously because we had to get her key, so that when we go to her, to yeah. her verse. It's her key. So that couldn't have happened accidentally. You know, that, 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 that took a lot of time. And it was Kenny that suggested Dolly on the phone. So then he went to Sandy Gallen and, and uh, asked if Dolly would do that. And, and she agreed to do it. So I think she came in on the day the same as Kenny did. And there was no accidental turn up from anyone. So that never happened. Do you think it, it's something about the industry you're in? And, you know, Kenny did a lot of movies and, and God rest his soul, obviously. Yeah. Um, to to embellish for the sake of the amazing yarn, even though the true stories are amazing anyway. I mean, I know you, you said that when Morris in the doco says that he had six Rolls Royces before he was 21, that you're like, no, no, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, this oh, listen, I, I think we're all, we all exaggerate. We all exaggerate, and, and we're all trying to come up with a, an interesting story that might have... I just think that's how Kenny remembered it. I don't think he was looking to embellish any... Kenny has been, uh, uh, as an, a number of times, on stage and to me, has said to me, you know, he says, I still don't know what Arms in the Stream is about. And, and I always say, well, you know, I do. But, but then again, it's about a number one record when all said and done. Yeah. You know? So whether you, I don't understand why you don't get it because you need to get around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I mean, I understand what it's about, and, and it's an Ernest yeah. Hemingway title. Um, and, but he uh, said that on stage. He said that in Glastonbury. I'm not quite sure what the song's about, but it was a big record. You know. I think Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You need to get a date. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. No, this is it's it's quite obvious what it's about. I I would have thought, but. Yeah. Um, uh, he, has a he, is a, he has been he has been known to be a pretty dogmatic right. um, man sometimes. You know, he's a, he's a lovely man, but I always get that from him. Right, you know? that's interesting. I mean, that, that song, as I said, is, is reportedly the biggest country hit of all time, and and well, most played, most played. most played. To be honest, uh, I said that once uh, to um, to a bunch of people at a gathering at David Foster's house. And somebody corrected me and said, no, it's the, it's the most played song, most played country record of all time. It's not necessarily the biggest selling record of all time. But that don't matter. No. <laughs> Here's a question which you don't have to answer. Um, you don't have to answer, <laughs> answer any question. But um, are you, do you have an idea in your head of the songs of yours that make you the most money every year? You know, that, that in royalties that come in, no. Islands in the Stream sort of like fifth. And to love somebody's yeah. kind of you know seventh. I don't know. You know what? I've never looked at it like that. I know that we get more requests for staying alive than we get anything else. So, so, but I don't know what makes us as far as income. We, I don't know. I just don't know. Um, there's all kinds of songs. It's a bit like um, 
it's a bit like Celine and Immortality and, and songs like that, that that I think it's maybe accumulative and that, that maybe the catalog is better off uh, with me just building and building on it and enhancing the music and, and keeping it alive and keeping it alive. I don't have a choice. I don't really have a choice as to which song is the most successful with regard to sync, sync licenses or all that stuff. I don't worry about it. Mm. You know? Well, th- another track from the album, uh, Jive Talking, with uh, Miranda Lambert and Jay Buchanan. So uh, what were yeah. they like? Oh, well, they did their vocals without me there um, because they weren't... Uh, Miranda hadn't been well. She had the flu. So the day that we were able to get her, I wasn't able to be in the studio, and and, and they got her vocals. And it's like I was saying, I think a lot of these artists, or at least th- uh, three or four of those artists, were much happier just doing their vocals with, with me not being there, you know. And I think that works. I, I get that. I get that. Well, there are some radio announcers who can't do a show if there there are people watching them do the show. So they might be broadcasting right. to lots of people, but uh, <laughs> you can't have... You don't want people watching and watching. listening to you, yeah. you know? <laughs> or judging you, which is probably what affects all of us. Yeah, yeah. Um, How Deep Is Your Love, as you mentioned, so that yeah. that's also another one with Little Big Town. And, um, yeah. and and I heard your interview with Gary Barlow from Take That, and, oh, and, yeah. and he... Um, like like anyone in the know is a massive fan, and and he admitted that he sang the wrong words when they covered "How Deep Is Your Love." I think there was one wrong. There's one wrong word. I can't remember what it was, but um, it's, uh, he didn't need to say anything about that. I don't care about that. Okay. Yeah, it was it was I really need to learn as opposed to I really mean to learn, and well, that's uh, right. That's yeah, right. It, it is is there yeah. is there a subtlety there that 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 um, is important, you know, that it's I really mean to learn how deep is your love as yes. opposed to need to. Yes, it's your intention. It's your, I, I, it's my intention to find out. Mm. It, 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 where I need to learn is, it has another meaning to it, mm. you know. So I, I spend a lot of time, what is it, doing that, sort of understanding what those words actually mean. We say things to each other every day that, that doesn't actually mean what we want to say, you know. So I try to I try to make sure those those words dig in that people understand the difference between mean and need. You know, it's 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 just a game. You know, it's 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 just a game. But but I don't mind that they got a word wrong. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. I I, That's I, great. I found it funny that he, he apologized. But um, no, I I loved I loved that interview that you did with him and and. Oh, uh, I remember hearing it. I'm thinking, oh boy, that's not the right word. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. The fact that they did it, you know, it's like Boy's Own uh, doing words, or um, any of those boy groups that sang our songs were were also giving us the greatest compliment. You know, so that's it. It's a bit like um, the Australian Bee Gees or or the Italian Bee Gees. It's a great compliment mm. but that they people would think that they could that that would work for them in their lives. I. I you know, I I don't understand any of it, but I love it. Um, but just as I let you go, Barry, um, and uh, right, we, we, we've done a yeah. done an hour and a half, and I, I could speak to you for hours. Um, I hope you you're <laughs> coping. I hope you're coping with COVID. Um, and know you've got a nice place to live at, at least, and you've got your family. Yeah, it's uh, maybe I think it's different for you, but but you can't go anywhere here. You can't leave the house. You know, it's crazy, absolutely crazy. But you know, I'm 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 not bored. I'm I'm quite happy watching Netflix and 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 reading and and but and we did all our work so we've got an album that's happening and and I I have nothing to complain about you know 50 I've been married 50 years now and and I can't be happier <laughs>